All right, just going to go through and refute Stephen Anderson's butchering of Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7 to 10 to try to prove that the second coming and the rapture are the same event. And he totally butchers what the passage is talking about and how the passage actually refutes the uh, quote-unquote post-trib you know, rapture, because rapture is not a scriptural term. The biblical term would be the resurrection, the uh, blessed hope, the catching away, all that. Um, so rapture is not really a scriptural term, but I, I will use the term rapture to just so people people know what I'm talking about. But Anderson totally butchers Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7 to 10 to prove his point. So let's get right into this and refute this. Another scripture that gives us insight as to the timing of the rapture is actually 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, where the Bible reads in verse 6, Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you, and to you who are troubled rest with us. The okay, first point I want to bring up is that uh, one of the arguments that post-tribbers like to use is they'll go to verses which talk about tribulation for Christians, and they'll try to say, see, that means we're going to go into the Great Tribulation. Uh, tribulation does not is not a reference to the Great Tribulation, which is not even a scriptural term. Tribulation just simply means that, you know, Christians, you're going to be persecuted, you're going to have a tough time in this life. That's just part of being a Christian. But just because the verse mentions tribulation does not mean that we're going into the Tribulation, which, again, the proper term is the time of Jacob's trouble or the time of the heathen. Okay, Jeremiah 30, verse 7, for the time of Jacob's trouble, and uh, Ezekiel chapter 30, verse 1 to 3, for time of the heathen, and Obadiah chapter 1, verse 15. But tribulation is always a description for this time period. You know, um, I think it's Matthew chapter 24, verse 21 and 22. Then shall there be great tribulation. Uh, Revelation 7, 14. These are they which came out of great tribulation. It's a description. But it's funny because the modern versions like the ESV and NIV change it to the Great Tribulation. So when you're using it as a title, you're actually parroting uh, New Version Doctrine, which is also just New Age too. So just wanted to point that out. Continue. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord, and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Notice a couple of times here the Bible uses the word when. So we get some timing elements here with the word when. The Bible says that God will give rest unto us as believers when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. Okay, the angels that come back with Jesus Christ, the angels mentioned in those passages are, I believe, referring to redeemed saints. And let me show you why I believe that, the scripture on that. Matthew chapter 22, verse 30. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. Okay, when you're saved, when you when you are, you know, resurrected, the rapture, you know, with the you know people, the worldly term people like to use, proper term is resurrection. Uh, you're as the angels of God. Okay, it doesn't mean you are an angel. Okay, you're not, you know, an angel, but you're as the angels of God. So I believe that uh, the angels that come back with Jesus Christ are redeemed saints. Okay. That's why the marriage supper of the Lamb happens in Revelation chapter 19, verses 6 to 10, I believe it is. Then after that, Revelation chapter 19, verse 11 to 21, Jesus comes back with his angels who are redeemed saints. That's who in Matthew chapter 24, verse 31, the angels are gathering the elect. I believe those are also redeemed saints. So Anderson, his, his argument is flawed because he thinks the angels are actually actual angels. No, they're redeemed saints that come back with them because they've been called up before this time period. So thank you for refuting your, your own point, Anderson. Because of ignorance of scripture, he doesn't even realize he's refuting his own point there. That passage actually refutes the quote unquote post-trib rapture. Because the angels are saints, they come back with Jesus Christ. That's when we are given our rest. And then in the same time, it says, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe. So Christ coming, 
will be admired in all them that believe and, and Christ will give us rest at the same time he comes to pour out his wrath. So you got a little bit of a problem there, Anderson, because you said that, because again, he says that the rapture is the same thing as the second coming, that the rapture is the same event as the second coming. Well, he also said that Jesus Christ will be admired by all at the second coming. You got a little bit of a problem there, because you read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51 and 54, and 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 14 and 18, the rapture passages, uh, where does Paul mention, mention anything about Jesus Christ being admired by all? Okay, you compare this in, Th in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7 to 10 with Matthew chapter 24, it does line up because all the tribes of the earth will mourn in verse 31 of Matthew 24. So it lines up there. Okay, but it doesn't line up with the rapture passages in 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Why? Because they're two different events. When the rapture happens, it's just the moment, it's just a split second and it's over. It's the moment in the twinkling of an eye. The events described here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7 to 10 are not happening within the moment in the twinkling of an eye. They're a process of events. So they're not the same thing. And plus two, where is the mention of dead saints being resurrected? In 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians 4, this both mention dead saints being resurrected. Where is that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7 to 10? It's not in there. It's not describing the same event as the quote unquote rapture. So Anderson, you're just refuting your whole argument because just simply comparing the two passages will show that they're not, they're not referring to the same event. Comparing 1 Thessalonians chapter, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7 to 10 with 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians 4 shows that they're not the same event. They're talking about two separate events. And again, the angels that come back with Jesus Christ are redeemed saints. Again, Matthew 22, verse 30. For in the resurrection, they are neither married nor given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. Paraphrasing, of course. But thank you for just refuting your whole point there, Anderson. Continuing. On this earth. Now, this is exactly what Luke chapter 17 teaches when it says that the second coming of Christ will be as it was in the days of Lot, where the same day they went out of Sodom and Gomorrah, it rained fire and brimstone on Sodom. The same day of the rapture, the Bible teaches God's going to begin to pour out his wrath on this earth. God is going to rain literal fire and brimstone from heaven with the opening of the seventh seal. That's the same day as the rapture. Uh, Steve Anderson, you just refuted your point again. You just said that it was God who opens the seals, but somehow the tribulation is not God's wrath. Um, let me show you a verse of scripture that, uh, that Anderson would probably not, would not show his audience. Okay, Revelation chapter six, beginning at verse one down to verse two. And I saw the lamb, I saw when the lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw and behold a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. And when he had opened the second seal, verse 3, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. Um, who's opening the seals? As Andrew said, Jesus Christ. So who's pouring out the wrath? In these, in these, there's, there's over 20 judgments in the book of Revelation. Who is pouring them out? Jesus Christ. Whose wrath is it? It's God's wrath. It's Jesus Christ's wrath all the way through. Want more proof on that? I mentioned these scriptures a little bit earlier, but uh, Ezekiel chapter 30, beginning at verse 1 down to verse 3. The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy and say, Thus saith the Lord God, How will ye? Woe worth the day, for the day is near, even the day of the Lord is near, a cloudy day. It shall be the time of the heathen. Okay, one of the proper terms for this time period is the time of the heathen, where God's pouring out wrath on these wicked Gentile nations. But notice how it's called the day of the Lord. It's referred to as being a day. Okay, that day is near. Well, I'll compare that with Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse number 7. More proof that this is that Jacob's trouble is the quote unquote tribulation. Tribulation, which is not even the biblical term. Uh, Jeremiah 30 verse 7, Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Okay? Proof on that. Further proof on that this is, in fact, God's wrath. Turn to Obadiah chapter 1, verse number 15. For the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen, as thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee, and thy reward shall return upon thine own head. Okay? Still not convinced? Because again, this is another scripture proving that this is also for judging the heathen nations. Uh, more scripture proving that. Turn to uh, Zephaniah 
chapter 3 and verse 8. Ooh, went to verse 7, verse 8. Therefore wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise and up to the prey. For my determination is to gather the nations, that I may assemble the kingdoms, to pour upon them my indignation, even all my fierce anger, for, the, for all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. The quote-unquote tribulation is God's wrath. Okay, it's, He's pouring out wrath on this earth. Again, Revelation 6, verse 1 to 3, Jesus is the one opening the seals. So somehow he's opening the seals, pouring out these over these 20 plus judgments, but then somehow it's not God's wrath. Sure there, Steve Anderson. Right. We'll believe you. you know, twisting scripture like crazy, but continuing. Now, the reason this is important is that a lot of people have been taught this false view of the rapture from the Left Behind series and other fictionalizations that they just take as fact. They don't realize it's just a Hollywood movie. So they take it literally and they think that people are gonna disappear and that everybody's gonna be wondering where they went. Well, there's no teaching in the Bible that the rapture is a secret rapture where people disappear and nobody knows why. Uh, I've never heard any, any pre-tripper say it's gonna be a secret rapture. See, this is a big lie. Post-trippers like to say, oh, they believe in a secret rapture. Um, no, I've never heard. I I don't I don't believe in a secret rapture. I don't believe it's going to be a secret silent thing, but it will be in the moment of something of an eye. Because Anderson, he's making fun of that. Oh, you think it's just going to happen? You know, just boom, we're gone. Um, that's what the Bible teaches. Okay, let me show you that. And this also makes a big problem for those who would think that for the post trippers to say that oh, um, the the rapture passages line up with Matthew twenty four. Got a bit of a problem there. First Corinthians chapter fifteen, down to verse fifty one. And behold, I show you a mystery. Key word there, mystery. This was not known before Paul revealed it. Okay? We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In the moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall, sh shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall all be, we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. You know, referring to the prophecy in Isaiah chapter 25, verse 8, the first part of the prophecy there. But in the moment and twinkling of an eye, just split second, it's just done that fast. Just like snap your fingers and it's done. Okay? But you see the events again described in 2 Thessalonians chapter t chapter. Um, 1 verse 7 to uh, 10, let me go there, Second Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 7 to 10, you see a process of events taking place. It's not happening within the moment and twinkling, twinkling of an eye. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Doesn't seem like it's going to be a moment twinkling of an eye. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction in, from the presence of the Lord and from the and from the glory of His power, and when He shall come to be glorified in His saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony is among our testimony among you was believed in that day. In that day, key word there. In that day, what you're referring to, the day of the Lord, the second coming. This is not talking about the rapture. Uh, this is a process you see here in, in verse 7 and 10 you see a process of events taking place it's not literally with it's not just happening thing there it's not happening within the moment and it's looking of an eye it's not just like boom it's done you see jesus come back he, he uh destroys the antichrist's army you know cast him into the lake of fire and then he's glorified it's not just in the moment and looking of an eye there's a step-by-step -step process there but anderson of course went to show his people that because he has to you know deceive them into thinking that Oh, it's talking about the same thing. You see, if you're going to make the rapture, the rapture the same as the second coming, you're going to run into all kinds of problems trying to prove that. And you're going to have to twist scripture like crazy. Continuing. In reality, Jesus Christ is going to come in the clouds. Every eye is going to see him. He's going to be admired in all them that believe. He's going to be there to rapture us up and then to pour out his wrath. And again, it begs the question, where does Paul talk about Jesus being admired and seen by all in 1 Corinthians 15 or 1 Thessalonians chapter 4? It's not in there. Because the, com the coming of Jesus Christ at the rapture is not a literal, like, physical coming down where he touches the earth. Okay? We meet him in the air. He doesn't come down to us. We, we go up to him. He calls us up by name, and we go up to meet him in the air. That's what goes on there. It's not where Jesus Christ physically touches the earth. That's the big difference there. The rapture is not a literal coming. The second coming of Jesus Christ, he literally touches the earth. 
I mean, it, like, like it's blatantly obvious that they're not the same event. Continuing. And nobody's going to be wondering, where did all these people go? They're actually going to be ducking and covering and hiding from the wrath of the Lamb and from him that sitteth on the throne. So it's really clear here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and in Luke 17 that the rapture takes place the day that God pours out his wrath. We are removed from this earth and then he pours out his wrath. We do believe in a pre-wrath rapture, but it's not a pre-tribulation rapture as the Left Behind series teaches. It's not a pre-trib rapture, it's a pre-wrath rapture. I showed earlier that it, it is God's wrath. Jesus is the one opening the seals, Revelation 6, verse 1 to 3. But on this passage of 2 Thessalonians chapter, two, chapter 1, verse 7 to 10, I'm going to bring up a few points that Anderson seemed to overlook, okay? I'm just going to read it again for you. And to you who are troubled, rest with us, when the Lord shall be, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Okay? In the rapture in 1 Corinthians 15, we meet the Lord in the air. Okay? It's different there. He, he, he's not revealed to everyone. We meet him in the air and that's it. Verse 18, or verse 8, and flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Compare that with Revelation 19, verse, uh, verse 11 to 21. He defeats the Antichrist's army, throws the Antichrist in the lake of fire. He shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord uh, and, from the, and from the glory of his power. And when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Okay? So he's admired among all of them. Okay? And again, you compare that with Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. You know, they shall mourn for him whom they have pierced. And then you compare that with Matthew chapter, I believe it's 24, verse 30. All the tribes of the earth shall mourn. So it's it's talking very clearly about a different event. You just compare the two passages. I mean, Anderson, he just quotes this one passage and builds his whole doctrine off this one passage. But a few notes I want to bring up about Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse uh, sorry, Second Thessalonians chapter one, sorry, verse seven to ten. First of all, verses seven to eight are telling of the events of Revelation chapter nineteen, verses eleven to twenty-one, when Jesus will be glorified because of his destruction of the Antichrist and his army. That's why verse ten says, "In that day." I brought that up earlier. It's referring to the second coming of Jesus Christ, also called the Day of the Lord. In Isaiah chapter 13, verses 4 to 13, Isaiah chapter 34, verses 1 to 8, Ezekiel chapter 30, verse 1 to 3, Obadiah chapter 1, verse 15, Joel chapter 2, verse 9, 29 to 31, and Joel chapter 9, verses, or sorry, and Joel chapter 3, verse 9 to 16, Malachi chapter 4, verse 5, and you read the passage in Zechariah chapter 14. It separates it from the rapture. In verse 10, Jesus Christ is glorified in his saints. This happens after the resurrection of the body of Christ, which occurs before the time of Jacob's trouble. You can see that in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10 to 14, where he gathers together his redeemed saints, purchased possession. Uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 23 to 25, which talks about how we wait for it, the rapture. We're waiting for the redemption of our bodies. We're not waiting for the revelation of the Antichrist. We're waiting for Jesus Christ. But if you're a post-tribber, you're disobeying that. You're waiting for the Antichrist. Romans chapter 11, verse 1 to 25, talks about how once the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, which you compare that with Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10, the dispensation of the fullness of times, once our fullness comes in, we're taken out of here and God goes back to dealing with the nation of Israel. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 8 to 10, which, you know, we're not appointed to wrath. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 to 18. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, through 2, verses 1 to 9. You compare that with Revelation chapter 5, uh, verses 9 to 11. There's blood redeemed saints in heaven before the Antichrist is revealed. Uh, Second, Th 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 Second Thessalonians chapter 2 talks about how there's somebody that has to be removed, which is the body of Christ, before the Antichrist can be revealed. And of course, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 and 58. This is after the body of Christ has gone through the judgment seat of Christ. See 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 to 10, and after the marriage supper of the Lamb. See Revelation chapter 19, verse 6 to 10. Okay? clearly describing two different events in this passage than in what Paul is describing in uh, 1 Corinthians 15. All this happens, what happens in this passage here of uh, for 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 7 to 10, it's describing what's happening at the, at the second coming, but all this happens after the rapture, the resurrection, uh, and after the judgment seat of Christ, and after the marriage supper of the Lamb. 
He seemed to miss those points there, but of course he'll deceive his audience. Because post-trib, post-trib rapturism, the doctrine, it's a bit built on deception. And I used to be a post-tribber, by the way. You know, a lot of, a lot of post-tribbers will say, oh, I, I, I used to be pre-trib, but when I studied the Bible, I, I became post-trib. Well, guess what? I'm the opposite. I used to be a hardcore post-tribber as a false convert, and when I studied the Bible, searched the scriptures, searched the scriptures whether these things were so, Acts 17 11, I became a pre-tribber, because I could clearly see there's all kinds of problems with the whole post-trip system. So I'm the opposite. I sourced the scriptures and went from post-trip to pre-trip because pre-trip is scriptural. So don't be deceived by this deception that, oh, it's, it's the same thing as, as the second coming, the rapture is. It's ridiculous. You compare the two passages. They're not clearly talking about two different events. So anyway, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with all the brethren. Goodbye. Thank you.